Willkommen zurück zum Minsk Forum. Ich hoffe, Sie hatten eine schöne Mittagspause. Wir hatten und haben immer noch eine sehr arbeitsreiche Zeit hinter uns. Ähm, unser Server, das minskforum.org, ist zusammengebrochen und wir versuchen gerade, unser Dienstleister versucht gerade, diesen Server umzuziehen. Wo sind wir zu sehen? Bei YouTube, auf den Channels der Konrad-Adenauer-Stiftung und der Friedrich-Ebert-Stiftung in den Sprachen Russisch und Deutsch. Und wir haben allen Ihnen eine Mail geschickt, in denen der Zugang, der barrierefreie Zugang zu diesen YouTube-Channels verfügbar ist. Dort finden Sie auch den Link zum YouTube-Link der Deutsch-Belarussischen Gesellschaft. Und dort bieten wir den Stream in der englischen Übersetzung an. Sie können auch gerne auf, auf Twitter schauen. Wir haben über unseren Twitter-Account dbg die entsprechenden Links zu den YouTube-Channels auch verschickt. So, leider wieder eine technische Vorbemerkung, bevor es inhaltlich wird. Und inhaltlich wird es mit Jakob Wöllenstein von der Konrad-Adenauer-Stiftung in Vilnius. Jakob, vier Monate nach den Wahlen, wie geht es weiter? Wie kommt Belarus raus aus der politischen Sackgasse? Das ist das Thema deines Panels. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen, honorable Mr. Latushko, dear... Vielen Dank, meine Damen und Herren, sehr geehrter Herr Latushka, sehr geehrte Experten in diesem Podium. Ich habe die Freude und Ehre, Sie jetzt willkommen zu heißen zu dem ersten unserer beiden Nachmittagspodien. Bei dem ersten geht es um Belarus nach vier Monaten Protestbewegung Wege aus der politischen Sackgasse. Wir haben bereits viel gehört über Belarus und die Situation. Very impressive, uh, long historical um, speech by Mr. Snyder, Professor Snyder who told us about the historic framework in which we see the events which are unfolding in Belarus at the moment. But we've also heard about numbers, about uh, how many people have been suffering. Putting these into numbers uh, is difficult, but I think it's necessary to see the dimensions. And we want to start talking now about um, taking stock further, but ways out of this crisis. We have one hour for this conversation with an excellent panel of six speakers. I don't think we will find all exhausting answers to all of these questions we have posed of ourselves, but I think it's good in a starting panel, in an opening panel for the discussions of the next two days to set the tone to some extent and, and to pay tribute to the title of the whole Minsk Forum this year, which is, of course, uh, taking stock and uh, talking about ways uh, forward. No, sorry, it was taking stock and perspectives for the future. Um, so without further ado, I want to start uh, with the panel. It is the only panel uh, in the whole uh, lineup of the forum, which is only which only features mm -hmm. Belarusian speakers. I am the only non-Belarusian as the moderator, and it's even a bigger honor for me. Um, I think in a way, this is a political statement that we very much agree that the situation in Belarus uh, is something which concerns Belarus and is supposed to be solved by Belarusians. And so we want to hear their thoughts on this today. We will have the second panel uh, with the perspective of the neighbors right after. Um, it is, at least from my side, not a political statement that among this lineup, we don't have representatives of the Belarusian regime now. Uh, as we've heard this morning, they were invited. Unfortunately, um, they did not uh, join our conversations today. But um, taking stock, I think, is the starting point if we want to speak about ways out. So the first panelist I would like to introduce to you is Mr. Valery Karbalevich, uh, who is a political scientist uh, in the Analysis Center Strategia. And we would like to ask him to give us his first impression, a five minutes introduction, how he sees the present situation um, and what are the challenges that we will then talk about when we want to find a way out. Mr. Uh, Karbalevich, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I hope you can hear me well. Well, I would like to be brief. The essence of the Belarusian revolution, and I would like to use this very word, revolution is exactly what's happening in Belarus now, is in the conflict between the authorities and the society. The society uh, requires to bring power back to the people, and the ruling regime is trying to cling to power using uh, just plain force and to ensure enforced legitimization. As Lukashenko rejects any dialogue with the society, reaching compromise is impossible, and Belarusian conflicts can be only settled through the victory of one of the conflicting party parties. Several months in a row, the country has been living 
uh, in the conditions of a cold civil war, which sometimes takes the forms of a real war. More than 30,000 individuals uh, have been detained. Belarus hasn't seen such level of political violence since the times of the Nazi occupation. And Europe hasn't seen such scale of protests since the 1940s. What are the in-depth reasons of the Belarusian crisis and the Belarusian revolution? I would like to voice several short arguments. A very interesting assessment of the Belarusian revolution, which I agree with, was given by Edward Lucas, the British political scientist. He said, you are running for the train that you missed in the 90s. This is the last echo of the revolution of 1989-1991. In other words, we are hearing the echo of the falling Berlin Wall. The main reason behind the revolutionary explosion is in the fact that the social model established by Alexander Lukashenko 25 years ago has depleted its resources and now is slowing down the development of the society. The society uh, has been developing faster than the state, and it no longer fits into the frames established by the state. So this conflict cannot be resolved until the government starts hearing the requirements of the society. In order to achieve this, any election, it, we need to understand that any election campaign may result in another political explosion. The government cannot hold the elections in the previous fashion as it used to do. And new elections are looming, as well as a referendum dedicated to the Belarusian constitution. The Belarusian uh, system was broken by the lack of trust towards Lukashenko. Uh, the legitimacy was to a significant degree based on the personal trust to the head of the state, and the trust crisis resulted in an acute political crisis, which entailed desecration, uh, so to say, of the uh, authorities. The authorities uh, are now deprived of any moral authority. And like in 2014 in Ukraine, this revolution has become a revolution of dignity. Within several months, we have seen uh, expedited uh, increase in the public awareness. And uh, now the people is the uh, political subject, which uh, the state does not acknowledge. Within several months, the civil society has been shaped in the country. The uh, shaping of the Belarusian nation is underway. And uh, normally, it takes some fight against some uh, empires or some external uh, enemies to shape a nation. But uh, it happened differently in Belarus. And this is another paradox of the Belarusian revolution. Within the recent months, we have seen uh, the fact that the Belarusian diaspora really exists and it actively supports the protests. However, the protest attitudes within the society and the upheaval has not resulted in uh, the uh, lack of uh, understanding among the elites, which uh, is a necessary prerequisite for the victory of the revolution. And the expectation that the state would start collapsing and uh, take the side of the society uh, was uh, not uh, actually uh, implemented in reality. Not a single public uh, institution is controlled by the society. They are not subordinate to the society. They are all sterile in terms of dissent. And there are uh, no uh, individuals that uh, do not share the state's stance in the authorities. There is a rigid vertical affair, which is personally shaped by Lukashenko. The state apparatus does not depend on the society, on the people, and thus it does not respond to its requirements, but it keeps its loyalty to its creator. That's why uh, the attempts to take the control over the state could not uh, bring success, and thus the victory of Belarusian revolution is only possible through the collapse of the state. How can this be implemented within the framework of a peaceful revolution? Well, this is a difficult question. Now, this hasn't happened a single time in history, so probably this is a unique Belarusian phenomenon. Within these months following the elections, there was a default of the state functions. State bodies are no longer performing their duties. Foreign policy in Belarus is collapsing. The country is losing its international capacity. The legal system 
have been almost destroyed. And without this, a fully fledged modern state is not possible. Business structures, culture entities are being destroyed deliberately, as well as those that are not loyal towards the ruling regime. The government is eliminating all the functions except for those that ensure preservation of power. State authorities that initially were designed to uh, to satisfy the requirements of the society are now being reoriented and are now being uh, now protecting themselves against the society. Yes, indeed, we're seeing a revolution of the regime towards militarization. Security forces are now a core element of Lukashenko's regime. And the last thesis, the Belarusian revolution does not have any geopolitical context. It is not pro-Western or pro-Russian. It is exclusively pro-Belarusian. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kabalevich, for pointing out the situation and for the description. Uh, it is, uh, I think, a very good segue. You mentioned that uh, some people expected the Belarusian elites to break apart. I think this is a good segue to introducing our second speaker, um, His Excellency Pavel Latushko, who is a former minister, long-serving ambassador, um, and I would say the highest ranking uh, person who switched sides, if you wish who is a member of the Presidium of the Coordination Council and has uh, formed this initiative of the National Anti-Crisis Management uh, residing in Warsaw. And the, the, um, the, the slogan of this anti-crisis management is act now. So uh, a person who wants to, to act. And according to a recent poll uh, conducted by the Chatham House, uh, not a small number of people in Belarus see in, in him a potential candidate for new presidential elections. So Mr. Latushko, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're looking forward to your take on how to solve the crisis. Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present my stance. First and foremost, I would like to state that today in our country we are seeing a profound political crisis, which already has become a regional security issue in Central and Eastern Europe, and it is really important to underscore this is an issue of regional security. The internal political crisis is related to the fact that the head of the state is not legitimate, which is proved by the majority of our citizens. In fact, um, legally, we are witnessing legal default. The constitution of the country does not work. The executive authorities are controlling the judiciary and the legislative systems. Thus, we do not have any division of powers, and all the powers have uh, been fused into a single uh, regime of a non-legitimate head of the state. In fact, we are witnessing mass repressions, more than 31,000 citizens of our country are subject to detentions and arrests. 4,000 citizens of our country have submitted uh, claims to law enforcement agencies in order to start proceedings related to cases of violence and violation of their rights. But not a single case has been initiated, not a single criminal case has been initiated, which also proves uh, the legal default. We're also witnessing a profound economic crisis that potentially can go into the economic default. Uh, the decrease in GDP, the decrease in gold reserves, the decrease in the reserves of the national currency, the decrease in the amount of export, the decrease in the amount of investment, and naturally the decrease in the uh, salaries of the population and pensions. All of this we're witnessing today. The society is facing a social and also a moral crisis, which confirms the presence of a regional security problem in the Central and Eastern Europe connected to our country. First of all, this is the foreign policy default. The illegitimacy of Lukashenko is confirmed by parliaments of many of the states. Now there is a threat to independence and economic sovereignty of our country. There is a significant rise in migration 
and number of refugees, which is now only curbed by the pandemic and uh, by the COVID restrictions. We have the diplomatic restrictions. The level of foreign policy for foreign political contacts of Belarusian authorities is almost zero in with many of the countries of the world. Throughout the four months, the situation regarding the approaches to get out of this situation has not yet changed. It has to be understood by everybody who is now in search for the way out of this crisis. First of all, I would like to rationalize it by the following. The European Union all the attempts of the European Union to carry out official relations with Belarusian authorities have not been successful and are currently not possible. The European Union, at the same time, is having active contacts with the Belarusian civil society. Second thing, Russia has the official contacts with the illegitimate Belarusian authorities, but refuses to communicate with the civil society. Such situation was the case in August, and it remains such in December. The reason why respective steps have not been made so far to change the situation are the following. Right now, I am the head of the People's Anti-Crisis uh, uh, Directorate, and I'm also the uh, member of Presidium of the Coordination Council, and uh, we have both the members of Coordination Councils and the members of the civil society and former officials. We are basically offering a toolkit to solve the task of establishing dialogue in the country. We uh, say that the dialogue needs to be forced, in fact. We are suggesting European Union to form a high-level mission to begin the dialogue with the Russian Federation and later in the future to force the Belarusian authorities to establish actual internal dialogue. If this mission cannot be formed for some reasons by the European Union, we suggest the head of the European Commission to assign and appoint a special representative on the question of the uh, Belarusian situation. Both cases uh, have already taken place um, in the practice of history of the European Union. Uh, why we have to have this dialogue? The benefits for the, for the European Union is that the human rights violation in Belarus will be stopped. We will also get rid of the regional crisis. Russia will also benefit because it right now is uh, experiencing huge losses in reputation and image by supporting the illegitimate regime. Uh, and there is also bad for the economy because um, the, a lot of money has to be invested to stabilize the economy of our country, which is bad for Russia as well. One more thing is that Russia does not acknowledge the reality and basically has double standards towards the violence which is happening in the territory of our country. Speaking about the you know, violations of human rights in France and in Poland, but turning a blind eye to the massive violations of human rights in Belarus. Why the dialogue matters for Belarus? Belarusians need to have the, a possibility to exercise their right to fair election, stop the legal default, stop the uncontroll uncontrollable migration, and stop the economic losses. But for that, we need the political commitment, political commitment of the European Union and political will of the Russian Federation. The Belarusian nation has the will and the commitment. Why the current Russian approach to Belarus is not possible? Russia suggests A, uh, the constitutional reform, and B, holding the elections. Well, actually, this is not a decision by the Belarusian people, but this is forcing an approach from the outside. Another thing, the violence has not been stopped. There is no investigation happening. The political prisoners are still in prison. And the constitution is not functional. And finally, given the complete legal default, it is not possible to change the constitution. It will not be accepted by the Belarusian nation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Latushko, for sharing your vision of very concrete instruments and how to moving forward, and also touching upon the international dimensions. We will come back to this uh, a bit later. But for now, I'd like to uh, take a closer focus on what has been mentioned very much so far, namely the Belarusian population and civil society. Um, we've heard and read this several times that uh, some analysts are convinced that what we see now is not less than the breakthrough of the formation of the Belarusian nation. Um, just to give one example, over a thousand local chat rooms have been founded in the last weeks and months uh, for people to organize around their courtyards. So those, those cells of civic engagement uh, are active and visible throughout. I would like to start uh, diving into this topic with Aksana Shelest, who is a sociologist at the Center for European Transformation, and we're looking forward to your analysis of the situation. Hello, everybody. I would like to start with uh, saying that um, it wouldn't be correct to see what's happening in Belarus right now as, uh, as a short-term process and some, some specific details. As you know, as soon as uh, these events um, started, uh, we started uh, uh, finding a name for it. And we, I think the best way is to call it the revolution of development. So it is the start of the um, social evolution. And I would agree to Mr. Karbalevich. Um, and I think that, you know, the, uh, the state institutions for the last 10 years currently uh, were developing towards conservation. But the social processes were developing in a different way towards emancipation, overcoming paternalism, overcoming the dependency from state institutions, developing new practices and innovative um, approaches. So there has been parallel development for these 10 years, and uh, not with the help of, but um, in spite of the state institutions. Why this matters today, it is the evidence that Belarusian society is now in the state which uh, gives birth to the revolutionary process that we are now observing. And the latest events that have actually triggered, to, triggered uh, were, were, they were the factor that actually um, influenced the political uh, upheaval of um, uh, the 2020. And, of course, we see the very strong reaction uh, from the part of the state, and all of that was also triggered by the situation with COVID crisis. So we can say that the last nine months, starting from spring this year, the Belarusian society has uh, gone a long way of self-organization. There was an outburst of different initiatives, uh, sometimes for specific um, purposes. Uh, actually, those initiatives started from um, local initiatives to fight COVID, and uh, we see the local communities, you know, the communities uh, from neighborhoods and so on that we see now. So the question is, what is the role of civil society? If you ask me, I would say, well, though it may sound a bit uh, provocative, but I think the idea is right. I think that the civil society today is the main actor of Belarusian revolution. Why? That is because when we have this value shift that is actually supported by the um, the latest research that showed the huge shift that the free Belarusian society from the value of stability and safety towards the value of development, freedom, and given that energy, given that preparedness for the changes, and the changes have already uh, uh, being long awaited, in fact, so it uh, upheaved the stability of the political institutions in the country. Of course, uh, there is no point in going deep about the reason, because the reason is what has been happening for over the last 10 years. The regime was uh, consciously destroying the political field as such. And eventually we have the absence of political field, absence of political institutions, and no experience of political action. So the uh, old school political opposition was just incapacitated, and the NGOs, the civil society, 
uh, though more productive, were still not the drivers. So the Belarusian revolution was like this self-organized, decentralized process. And on the one hand, this is a strong part of it. But on the other hand, this strength remains a strength. However, we have a problem related to that. What we have today is we have a large-scale grassroots support. We have the consolidated requirements. We have already spoken about that. And those requirements are not limited to stopping violence. They are not limited to establishing justice. This is the requirement of re-establishing the political system of the state. After getting into the legal default, after all that has happened, we have the clear aim to have the changes in the setup of the authority as such. And we seek the engagement of the people and the civic initiatives that are currently not really coordinated and don't have a common plan. However, today, the new political leadership is rather following the processes in Belarus uh, rather than uh, influencing them and uh, driving them. So, yeah, you know, the Minsk community is also interacting in those local community chats that we've spoken about. So they have a growing request growing demand for such coordination, a roadmap that would drive this revolution to victory. And currently, maybe I have missed something, but I know just virtually a couple of uh, offers of that kind. First, uh, the anti-crisis uh, the directorate's suggestion to make the transition of power, and then the roadmap to get out of political crisis uh, offered by a Belarusian political scientist, Mr. Maskevich. But however, those suggestions are not broadly debated and uh, they, uh, they don't receive any feedback. And I think this point is one of the key elements that would uh, uh, let the civil society that has uh, arise to go further in our political discussion. Thank you, Michelist. Um, the word self-organization was mentioned a few times, and I think it's a very deciding moment. And now I would like to turn over. You said uh, the civil society is the main actor in the revolution, and we have uh, among our panelists a gentleman who represents not civil society as a whole, but one initiative, namely Andrei Karpiaka, who is an urbanist at the Minsk Urban Platform. Uh, and we would like to hear his perspective from someone who's active in civil society. Hello, I appreciate the opportunity to present the stance of the civil society at Minsk Forum. I have been working this area for more than five years, and today's crisis has profoundly affected the civil society. Its impact is uh, duplex, actually. On the one hand, well, there are civil society organizations. On the other hand, there are uh, grassroots initiatives that are not coordinated. And right now, this division is uh, very important. Currently, uh, the grassroots initiatives are becoming increasingly important. And this is what we start thinking about whenever we think about the civil society in Belarus. What now is happening uh, with the organizations of the civil society currently in Belarus? The members of such organizations are extremely vulnerable. They're currently experiencing fear. And that's the way it's been throughout their existence in Belarus. And after the elections, many NGOs stopped their activities. Many uh, members of NGOs left the territory of Belarus, and I believe it is extremely important to take into account. Apart from arrests and detentions, they also facing the absence of legitimate authorities that they could engage with. Many NGOs were focused on cooperation with the state. Besides, we're facing a crisis that is so profound that discussing the ecology or the welfare of animals or anything else is relegated to the background. And what is becoming increasingly important is the state-orchestrated violence. Besides, there is a positive issue related to the organization of the work of the civil society. There is a trend towards more close cooperation with grassroots initiatives. And there is uh, more uh, elaborated uh, demand for 
uh, territorial self-administration, which is currently discussed in the Belarusian society. As for the grassroots initiatives, at this level, we can see uh, citizens becoming increasingly active, and uh, these activities are taking the shape of different forms of protests. Uh, this will not necessarily become institutionalized and will not necessarily turn into a system because there are no democratic practices and uh, the decision-making process is not democratic. The trust towards institutions is undermined as a result of mandatory participation in the activities of the civil society. Uh, and besides, there is a stigmatization of uh, activists that are today branded as social parasites. At the same time, the situation is being gradually improved thanks to closer engagement of this civil society with grassroots initiatives that is happening today. Also, the situation that we're witnessing for the time being is extraordinary. And there are no guarantees that people would want to participate in a civic life after the situation is somehow resolved. But the positive thing here is that due to the long period of protest, the uh, movements are being shaped. There are web chats and, uh, being created, as well as different uh, local movements that will allow us to implement the general agenda. The main preconditions for restoration of the work of uh, civil society organizations are related to ending of violence, relief of detained activists, and the transfer of power to the legitimate political subject that could act as a partner towards the civil society. This is not the case for the time being, and we're witnessing a transition of professional activists of NGOs to grassroots initiatives because for the time being it is almost next impossible to normally perform the functions of NGOs. What can they do now under the current conditions? They can support the grassroots initiatives, sharing their con contacts and sharing their experience. And this is what we're currently observing. This is what currently being done by the NGOs that are continuing their activities in Belarus. As for the local communities and grassroots initiatives that are actively developing now, they need to have their stake in the decision-making process. They need to have their say in this process. Also, for local communities, the further organizational development requires their political representation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We still stay for a while with uh, the civil society, but we go now from, uh, we've been talking about Minsk a lot uh, so far, but now we want to take a look into the regions. And our next speaker is uh, the co-founder of the Citizens Committee of Khrodna, Mr. Dimitri Vandarchuk. Thank you for being with us. We're looking forward to your perspective from the west of Belarus. Uh, Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me well. First and foremost, I would like to wish all the participants of the Minsk Forum, as well as all those that are exiled from Belarus, all those that are currently sanctioned, to get back to the offline environment, to be released, to become free so that they could join their efforts in helping Belarus. And Grodno is all, always glad to welcome guests from everywhere. Well, my five minutes are dedicated to mobilization and civil activities taking place in the regions. A lot already has been mentioned. In order to wrap it all up, a catalyst of mobilization was the visualization of the protests, to put it this way, because in spring, when in response to the inadequate assessment of the threats coming from the coronavirus, we started developing and creating different self-assistance uh, organizations, we already felt that something was happening. There were some pre-election activities taking place that demonstrated to Belarus the huge potential of a peaceful protest movement. Let us recall, at the uh, stage of registration of initiative groups, we saw a lot of active individuals. Uh, we saw the queues 
related to the collection of signatures, and people were standing up for the rights of their candidates. There were numerous meetings in different cities and communities. Therefore, all the people who saw each other wearing white wristbands during the election day, all of this helped to visualize a number of researchers who are standing for the change. And it is extremely important to feel this and to see this at least once in order to understand the huge potential behind this. I would like to agree with Mr. Kavalevich uh, that this campaign, for the first time in history, showed that we have a, so to say, seventh region of Belarus that is being outside the territory of the country. This is our diaspora that has demonstrated its solidarity with all the pro-change activists functioning in Belarus. As for Grodno, I would like to say that the mobilization started in 2017 when there was a first round table with the original authorities. And at that round table, we managed to agree on the practice of implementation of the law on mass activities and mass events and rallies. Starting from 2017, we were organizing our events legally. For example, the BNR 101, the anniversary of the Belarusian Republic, uh, was also the result of that round table. During the last, the previous elections, there was a district where the social and political activists joined their efforts in order to work in a single district in order to have the voice of Grodno heard in the parliament. In spring, we united our efforts in order to establish a volunteers group dedicated to COVID response. Thus, after several days of unprecedented violence following the 9th of August, we managed to use the entire potential in order to stabilize the situation in the city and in order to create the uh, communication between the protest uh, activists and the authorities. This is how we managed to hold some talks, some negotiations during those uh, days in August. But this attempt was terminated actually unilaterally because I believe there was too much attention paid to Grodno by the authorities. And besides, the authorities were envisioning a different scenario in Grodno, both in Grodno city and in Grodno region. They were playing out a different scenario. And that's why we had to change, or they had to change the governor um, down to send Mr. Karanik to support him on the position. All this resulted in huge uh, pressure experienced by the protest activists. There are more than 200 criminal cases initiated and several thousands of people in uh, detention, let alone uh, people that were laid off, let alone people that were exiled or had to flee the country. So the crisis is being prolonged and the protest forms are changing and evolving, starting from uh, street manifestations and finishing with new forms of peaceful protest, because it is of paramount importance to keep the peaceful nature of the protest, that it values the strongest resource of the state, namely the law enforcement agents, and thus the state cannot employ this uh, resource to the full potential. Something has been said about the uh, different local grassroots initiatives and uh, such measures actually are not receiving probably that much attention in the mass media if compared to mass demonstrations but these grassroots initiatives are equally important because what really matters is not only the resignation of lukashenko we need also to oust mr lukashenko not from the not only from the uh not only from this position, but also from the uh, minds of Belarusians that have been living with him for almost quarter of a century. And change will happen not when uh, the 
uh, formal authorities will be changed, but when real changes will happen in the minds of Belarusians, when they will be represented in the parliament, in the lower chamber of it as well. So then our voice will finally be heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. There were many, many important points made mm. already now and that we will uh, take up in the following uh, discussion on this panel, but also tomorrow there will be a whole panel completely and exclusively uh, devoted to the question of civic engagement in the region, so looking forward uh, to even diving into that much deeper. But now uh, we have the last speaker in a row, and we started with an analyst, and we want to conclude this first round with an analyst. With us is Vadim Majeko, who represents the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies. He is an associate professor at the Belarusian State University of uh, physical culture, and uh, we dis we discussed that he will speak about problems and prospects of dialogue amid the protests. We've heard a lot about the dialogue so far, and I'm looking forward to hearing your take on this, what dialogue is possible. Yeah, thank you, Jakob. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Indeed, I would like to dedicate my intervention to the discussion of prospects of uh, dialogue amid the protest, because many issues have already been voiced by my colleagues, and I would not like to repeat those. So I will focus on the topic of negotiations that, in my opinion, is a key to further development of the situation and its settlement. It is really important to state that both sides of the conflict uh, declared the support of dialogue. However, each side envisions this dialogue differently, both in terms of the preconditions of it and the time and the composition of uh, the participants, as well as the scope of topics touched upon. Anyway, they have already voiced their uh, willingness to participate in the dialogue. Still, the sides are still focused on final victory, and this is what they aspire for. Actually, uh, this attitude is actually similar for both sides, the authorities and the protesters. They want to receive landslide victory and then finally punish every participant uh, in particular. But the protests have been ongoing for many days, and it has shown that not a single side, uh, neither of the sides, uh, are strong enough to receive this victory. And actually, this seems a obvious sign of uh, progress of the protests, because some 10 years ago, during the uh, mass rally that uh, was dispersed in 6.5 minutes, uh, apparently the situation is drastically different. What was the problem uh, hindering real dialogue? This is the fact that both sides have some preconditions that are mutually unacceptable. As for the authorities, the authorities want to discuss some positive and constructive agenda, constitutional reform, for example, meanwhile ignoring the interests of the population and ignoring the situation with the law enforcement agents and the political prisoners. The authorities want to have uh, the opponents that they are okay with engaged in this protest. These will be some abstract representatives of uh, different businesses and industries. Uh, these are also some fake civil society organizations, including the Belarusian Association of Trade Unions, as well as uh, the pro-regime politicians and defectors that are okay with any agenda, including Viktor Krasensky. So, as we can see, dialogue is not happening. And imitating it doesn't really help to solve the problems in the society, uh, because of which the uh, authorities have to imitate dialogue in the first place. So, it doesn't really work. The opponents of the authorities, um, in particular the Coordination Council, uh, they also are ready, they are only ready to carry out uh, the dialogue after some requirements are fulfilled. Um, but basically, the requirements are, you know, almost equal to Lukashenko's resignation. So even if we don't talk about the um, election question, at least investigating the violence uh, from the law enforcement people, um, the only 
achievement of that would be um, that uh, they will stop um, um, being ready to uh, uh, use violence against the people, because if they see that this is punishable, then the authorities won't be able to rely on them anymore. So uh, this is such a requirement that will basically uh, leave the authority without any measures to resort to. At any point of negotiation, this concerns both the protesters and the authorities. The point of negotiating is that you, know, you are not negotiating with somebody, uh, not with somebody you like, that you have to negotiate when your requirements on the key issues are not fulfilled. So that is exactly uh, negotiations uh, are needed when you have no other way of achieving what you want. And the negotiations uh, are something you have to do with somebody who you don't normally like, who a position you don't accept. So, you know, you can negotiate uh, when you're at war, during the conflict, during a uh, problematic situation. So, uh, negotiating doesn't mean you agree. And so I think it is important to say negotiations instead of dialogue, since, uh, yeah, I know dialogue is uh, a complex thing. In this case, uh, it's difficult to have it. So what alternatives to negotiations there are? First, solving the conflict by force. But the parties don't have the necessary resources, nor do they have the decisiveness to um, apply it. That is why they are only applying non-lethal weapon, and uh, that is why the protesters are not using the forces. And so, you know, Lukashenko has the tanks, all the communication channels, but he knows that if he escalates the situation, the things will only get worse. The war won't solve everything. The second alternative is to um, preserve the current situation, the stalemate, and uh, you know, the authorities hope that people will be uh, intimidated by the current level of violence, um, and then the people hope that the law enforcement people will join them, that the sanctions prevent uh, the authorities uh, from acting efficiently. So that's the situation, and this alternative is the most uh, probable because it doesn't imply any changes, any significant changes in the actions of the parties. It's, uh, but uh, irrespective of how things end up, uh, the Belarusian economy will be destroyed in process. It will take uh, decades uh, to recover, and uh, somebody will have to uh, be held responsible for that. And, you know, every day of the protests uh, deepens uh, the gap in the Belarusian nation the discord in the Belarusian nation. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, the Belarusian society just did not want to, to stop that. So, I would like to believe, of course, that both parties will understand the costs of uh, what is going to happen if this continues and that they I hope they will uh, be ready to negotiate. Negotiations, of course, won't achieve uh, the, um, the outcome that will be acceptable for everybody, but this will help prevent the escalation of violence. Thank you, Vadim. I think you made a valuable point that there is a difference between negotiations and dialogue and that both concepts require a different um, willingness also to engage with the other side. Uh, dear Mr. Latushko, I would like to come back to you with uh, with two questions. The first of them being, um, you made the point that uh, the con con conversation about uh, the constitutional reform is not something that the Belarusian people want, but taking uh, this, this notion of uh, negotiations instead of dialogue, do you think there would be a scope to use that as a starting point, this dialogue about constitutional reform, if um, the, the demands for an end of violence and release of political prisoners were accepted by the regime as a starting point. Maybe given the lack of time, I was speaking too fast. I was not speaking that the Belarusians do not want constitutional reforms. I uh, was speaking about why it is not possible to implement the Russian approach on implementing the constitutional reform in Belarus. So we need to be realistic and understand that Lukashenko didn't want to ch didn't want to change anything. He didn't want to change the constitution. He didn't want to hold new elections. And the fact that the internal political agenda includes the, uh, the changes to the constitution, this is the initiative of the Russian Federation, not Lukashenko, not Belarusian people. 
so in that particular moment in time. Why this is not possible? It is not possible because the constitutional reform in the period where it is forced from the outside is not possible. When the violence is, has not yet stopped, and there is not yet an investigation on the facts of uh, the crimes against the people where there are political prisoners in the country. Uh, the repression machine is running. In this case, we cannot accept the new constitution. The key factor and the reason um, is the fact that we have a legal default, the non-working present constitution, and multiple violations of the existing constitution. How can we, in such atmosphere of legal default, even put up the question of a new constitution? The primary idea is holding the election, the presidential election, but of course the preconditions are re the release uh, of uh, the political prisoners, uh, the accountability and uh, punishing the guilty. So the next point is uh, the election and the constitution. Uh, in my personal opinion, the change of constitution and shifting to the parliamentary presidential republic is possible after electing the president. Why? To avoid chaos in the country, to avoid disorganization of uh, the public administration bodies that may cause the internal actions to recuperate the situation on the part of the military or other civil groups, there can be additional threats externally. So, most importantly, we need to hold the elections as soon as possible. And then uh, there is another opinion that we can have the constitutional referendum at the same time with the election. But I think this is not the best approach, even though I don't really exclude it. This is my position. Thank you. And the second question um, is picking up from uh, the observation uh, Oksana Shalest made that there is a strong activity of people and this galvanization of society. Um, but that apparently uh, the, the ways out, including the one you described, are not being discussed at the same level they might deserve in terms of attention. Um, do, do you think, or how do you secure that uh, the concepts that are being discussed uh, with, with you being in Warsaw and other people being in exile are in close touch with the Belarusian people in Belarus? So this rhetoric that is constantly being promoted by Russia that the political leaders that are outside do, uh, do not have the support of the people and they do not have the right to participate in the internal political processes as the members of a dialogue. In our opinion, this idea does not stand up to any criticism. As Mr. Lavrov, who I think yesterday is, um, said that at the uh, OSCE uh, summit, uh, OCSTO summit, I'm sorry, um, or any, some other platform, I don't remember. The idea was that uh, the point is that uh, the political leaders, the strongest political leaders in Belarus are imprisoned. It is over 140 prisoners. Babariko, Kolesnikova, Znak, Statkevich, Severinets. This list can be continued. The ones who are outside the country, in the first place, I would like to say that this is Svetlana Tikhanovska, they are forced to be there. They were forced in exile. More than once, I underlined that as soon as the criminal uh, uh, cases are stopped, the political leaders will be ready to return to Belarus. So now we could consider different platforms, different fora, we could think about beginning a dialogue in the territory of a third country, like Sweden you know, as the new OSC chair, or Austria that is very much interested in figuring out that situation, having a, a serious uh, economic and political stake both in Belarus and in Russia. And at that round table, dialogue or negotiations, as they are called, of course, this has to feature both the representatives of the authority and representatives of um, the Coordination Council and Svetlana Tikhanovska, representatives of political party and the repressed. 
But the point is that the authorities don't want to release the repressed people from prison. They don't want to release the people that are um, f- uh, in prison for political causes. So the base preconditions um, are still there. Stop the violence, release all the political prisoners, and everybody who committed illegal acts must be held responsible. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience. Mr. Borone Kozicki is asking, looking forward into the future, this is uh, the glass ball to some extent, how likely is it that the awakening of society, which we see right now, will translate into entirely new composition of the parliament in Belarus? Maybe Mr. Karbarevich can give us uh, his take on this. Для того, чтобы... To translate the social awakening into new institutions, uh, parliamentary majority, for example, we need to give back the elections. Right now, Belarus has no elections, no institute of elections, just absolutely no. And we need to return the acting social state institutes, such as the parliament, court, the constitutional court, the local councils, all that has to be brought back. And only after that will we be able to debate about the results of the parliamentary elections. So we need to start from the wrong end, from a different end, rather. Thank you. Um, to Vadim Majeko, do you see uh, the, the, this process or the, the, the question of parliamentary elections, which uh, we haven't touched upon now, everyone is talking about the presidential elections, but do you see this as, as a point which is there already in the society that people are, are thinking about strategically, when this has to come um, in, the, in the setting of, of what has to happen in the future to get out of the crisis? What role does it play? Thank you so much for the question. I think people don't go deep into details, they don't think about parliamentary elections, because, yes, um, just as it has been said, parliament parliament is non-functional today. So the representatives of the Belarusian society who are not involved in Belarusian society, they don't even know what kind of body this is and what role it fulfills. But, of course, this understanding will live up after we hold uh, free elections, and of course, any changes to Belarusian political systems, even if they are initiated by uh, Lukashenko, by the new authorities, whoever, they will have to do with the new parliament, establishing the new parliament, because of course, um, we cannot really uh, narrow down the functions of a parliament more than they are now, so the functions will be expanded, and the new parliament will allow the new initiatives to uh, show themselves more sustainably. So will allow the new political forces to distribute the balance and the spheres of their influence. And of course, from the point of view of external actors like Russia, uh, even in the uh, most free of all elections, uh, uh, pro-Russian forces will still be represented in the Belarusian parliament. And that is why um, all the stakeholders um, uh, are interested, all those who are interested in changes in Belarus are also interested in this scenario. But regarding what has been said uh, so far, the basic prerequisites, of course, uh, are still there. That's right. The question is how to bring the negotiation process closer, bring it forward. And of course, we know that the authorities won't be interested uh, in um, holding the negotiations on the terms that they are offered. We need to think about the tools that we can act upon and uh, we need to think about uh, being flexible in values and being flexible in tools and instruments to bring forward the changes. Thank you so much. And the thanks go to all of you, to our uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. Karbalevich, Mr. Latushka, Ms. Shellist, Mr. Bandarchuk, Mr. Karpeka, and uh, Mr. Majeka. Thank you very much for, I think, a very good an insightful opening panel. Uh, we did not touch upon, no, we did touch upon uh, the international dimension, but we did not go into all the details since this is up for the next panel. Um, but now it's my uh, pleasure to give it back to uh, the Minsk Forum Studio, to our Master of Ceremony. Looking forward to continuing uh, the discussions with you over the next days.
Kopp und vielen Dank für dieses sehr, sehr spannende Panel. Das schon uh, thank you, everybody, for this very interesting panel. That has already shown uh, a good way out of this uh, situation. I have good news. Our website is online again, so you can use it for your questions that we can pass on to the moderators. So we are very happy about this. Now we'll have a short break, a short a uh, short bio break, uh, and at uh, 2.30 p.m., uh, we shall pass over to Warsaw and talk about Belarus and its neighbor countries. See you in a short while. Thank you.